What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another read through. Today we are reading through Tales from the Pizzaplex number five, story number two, The Storyteller. And this one is good, okay? You probably read Gregory or not Gregory, GGY. Uh, and if you've read that, you'll know that this book is off to a great start. Uh, but it's it, it gets better. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, like, I feel like they're kind of on the same level. Uh, GGY and the storyteller. I think this one is um, is quite lore heavy, I would say, but it's really really cool to see. And we've been hyping the story up for ages because we know it's about the Fazbear Entertainment Board of Directors, uh, which are the higher ups of the company. And we've seen in Bobby Dots Part One that, of course, Abe lives in the Fazplex Towers because he is a higher up. So hopefully this takes place. In the Fazplex Towers, and we're going to see if that is the case uh, in this story. Obviously, I already know what happens. I've read the leaks, but we are getting into the full story right now. So make sure you subscribe so that you see when I upload more audiobooks. And soon, I think I want to make some actual videos, kind of dissecting each story, uh, which is going to be cool. So uh, yeah, stick around for that. Anyway, the storyteller. Let's get it. Um, I've never said that before. Let's get it. Mr. Burroughs plucked the wire-rimmed reading glasses from his Romanesque nose and used the glasses to tap the spreadsheet in front of him. He gave the accountant sitting on the left side of the massive cherrywood conference table one of his best withering glares. I feel like... Oh, yeah, never mind. I feel like you're boxing us in here, Mr. Burroughs said. These numbers can't be real. Mr. Burroughs looked down the length of the 16-foot table. His gaze went from the accountant to each of the other eight board members in turn. It finally landed on one other man in the room besides the accountant who wasn't a board member. Mr. Burroughs sighed. Sitting at the far end of the table, directly opposite to Mr. Burroughs, Edwin Murray gazed out the picture window that took up much of the outer wall of the red-painted conference room. Murray's bulging grey eyes were unfocused as if he was looking past the mega pizzaplex that dominated the view from the Fazbear Entertainment Executive Office building and even past the rolling hills behind the pizzaplex. Heck, the old coot was probably looking further than the hills, out into some kind of virtual la-la land in his strange mind. Yes, that's right everybody, I believe this takes place in the Fazplex Towers, which is insane. It's really cool to see all of these stories connect. Mr. Burroughs replaced his reading glasses precisely on his nose. He made sure the glasses were perfectly poised. Mr. Burroughs knew from hours of studying himself in the mirror that when his glasses were situated just so on the prominent bridge of his slightly downward curved nose, his, pow his powerful stature as a man to be listened to was unmistakable. Mr. Burroughs understood that he wasn't handsome in the classical sense. He had a fine jawline, sculpted cheekbones, and a strong, full mouth. However, the majestic nose was just a bit too majestic, and his eyes were a tad too small and set close together. Even so, his dark, almost black eyes, and this shiny ebony hair that liked to flop over his broad forehead in a charming sort of way, combined with the aforementioned nose to create eye-catching impact. People noticed Mr. Burroughs, and they listened to him, despite his relatively young age. At 35 years old, Mr. Burroughs was the youngest ever Fazbear Entertainment Board Chairman. It was a coup to have achieved such a position so quickly, but it was one he deserved. Mr. Burroughs, who had insisted on being called Mr. Burroughs since he entered college at the, pre uh, at the precocious age of 13, had an IQ in the stratosphere and his extraordinary creative vision ran neck and neck with his business acumen. Mr. Burroughs scanned the cost spreadsheet that was the focus of this board meeting. If these numbers are correct, he said, the Mega Pizzaplex won't make one red cent the way it's currently set up. He once again took off his reading glasses. That's the box. I refuse to be trapped in a box. That means we have to pare things down. If we shave off the excess, we can raise the profit margin and get out of the box. Mr. Burroughs put his finger on the line item that had gotten his attention. Is this figure correct? He asked Dale, the skinny young accountant who is supposedly a savant with numbers. Mr. Burroughs knew Dale never got numbers wrong, but he liked to keep the kid in his place. Dale cleared his throat. Um, yes, sir. 
I ran the Mr. Burroughs waved a hand. Afternoon sun streaming in through the window caught the diamonds in his pinky ring and refracted a rainbow across the printed spreadsheet. What amazing writing. Mr. Burroughs took a moment to enjoy the reds and blues and yellows. He loved reds and blues and yellows. That was why the conference room was filled with those colours. All the paintings on the walls, impressionistic depictions of classic retro Fazbear animatronic characters, featured the vibrant colours Mr. Burroughs favoured. They meld in nicely with the room's red walls. He wished the carpet was something other than a dull grey, but the board had uncharacteristically refused to, br to back him when he'd lobbied for replacing it with a brighter shade. Dale coughed. Mr. Burroughs brought his attention back to the matter at hand. I'm sure the number is right, Mr. Burroughs said, even if it's not exact. The import is clear. Uh, Mr. Burroughs leaned back. His black leather chair creaked. He smoothed his burgundy silk tie over his crisp blue cotton shirt, then interlaced his fingers and rested them on his chest. Clearly, creative development is gobbling up a massive chunk of our overhead. The team is going to have to be downsized. Edwin had only been peripherally paying attention to the board meeting ever since he'd reluctantly taken his seat at the outlandishly large table. These meetings were generally a waste of time, but given that Edwin had been placed onto the board via Fazbear Entertainment's buyout of his engineering company decades before, he was expected to be here. He was barely more than a mascot at this point. Still, he was resigned to being present. Often, his input was the only thing that stood between the board's tendency toward fly-by-the-seat-of-the-pants decisions and more level-headed thinking. Still, Edwin didn't like the time he spent in this huge room with its thick grey carpet, so thick it felt like trudging through sand. And he'd hated the meetings ever since Mr. Burroughs had become the chairman. Edwin loathed Mr. Burroughs, the affected, vain, pompous jerk who refused to be called by his given name, was not only annoying in the extreme, he was also dangerous. Mr. Burroughs didn't think, he just acted. Case in point, the decision he'd just made. Edwin, who had been trying to pretend he wasn't in the room, whipped his gaze away from the window. Did I hear you right? He asked, knowing full well that he had. Did you suggest downsizing the heart and soul of the mega pizzaplex, firing the very people who have been responsible for the pizzaplex's enthusiastic popularity? Mr. Burroughs sighed and closed his eyes. I take issue with your premise, he said as if talking to himself. The creative development team has contributed to Pizzaplex's success, obviously, but to say they've been responsible for uh, but to say they've been responsible for it is to strain the truth to its breaking point. Edwin opened his mouth, but Mr. Burroughs didn't let him speak. Spending this much money on creative content, nothing more than the ideas of people sitting around making stuff up, is outrageous, Mr. Burroughs said. The backbone of the Pizzaplex, in fact, of Fazbear Entertainment as a whole, isn't the stories, it's the technology. Without the tech, without the animatronics and the software that runs them, the stories are nothing. We might as well be selling camping excursions, requesting that people pay for the privilege of being told a horror story while they roast marshmallows, Edwin snorted. I can tell from years of experience that without the stories, all your hardware and software would be nothing more than lumps of metal and wires and a meaningless mass of zeros and ones. Story drives Fazbear Entertainment. Mr. Burroughs toyed with his showy pinky ring. Be that as it may, we need to get in the black. But, Edwin started. Mr. Burroughs held up his ring-free hand. I'm not suggesting that we give up story development, Edwin. Edwin felt his jaw muscles bunch at the way Mr. Burroughs used his name. Mr. Burroughs always put heavy emphasis on the win part of Edwin. The stress was purposeful, a slap in the face reminded that Edwin wasn't a winner at all. Oh, the only reason he was part of Fazbear Entertainment was because his own company had failed. Mr. Burroughs loved to remind Edwin of that fact. I actually really like how it's going, uh, how this story is going so far. It's structured really well because we've seen two different perspectives already. Like we're only like a few pages in and we've seen two different perspectives from both of the board members. And they clearly have very uh, like opposing views. One of them wants uh, to keep telling stories and one of them wants to focus on the technology side of things. But when you think about it as a whole, Fazbear Entertainment is both. Like it is about the technology. It is about improving uh, society in that sort of way and making sure that, um, I, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, 
Uh, making sure that safety is a priority. No, I, I, I don't think Fazbear Entertainment thinks safety is a priority. But making sure that the latest technology is there. But also, yes, without the stories, Fazbear Entertainment probably wouldn't be as popular as it is. So it's a little bit of both and that they, they need to find a middle ground, but they, they clearly aren't. So they're probably going to get in this argument for the rest of the story. Um, Mr. Burrows held up his ring-free hand. I'm not suggesting that we give up story development, Edwin. Oh, wait, no, I've read all that. Uh, Mr. Burroughs loved to remind Edwin of that fact. Mr. Burroughs looked around at the other board members. Wouldn't you agree, ladies and gentlemen, that Fazbear Entertainment has the best minds in the industry? Edwin rolled his eyes as he watched the board members nod. Mr. Burroughs knew darn well that no one at this table was going to disagree. As Mr. Burroughs waxed e eloquent on the company's creative and technological technological accomplishments, Edwin tuned him out and studied the other board members. The Fazbear Entertainment board was made of five men and four women. Edwin, at 64 years old, was the oldest person in the room. At least I'm not the baldest, he thought. Two of the five men were full on bald, and two of them had receding airlines. The thought made Edwin feel like a kid saying, nah, 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 but it made him feel good. He had to do something to hold his own in this room full of sleek, well-dressed, pretty people. The five men in the room, despite hair loss, could all be described as good-looking, and the women ranged from, uh, ranged from attractive to downright beautiful. Everyone in the room excluded wealth. Edwin knew that if someone had the temerity to come into the room and rob its occupants, the jewellery hall alone would be in the hundreds of thousands. Edwin, in contrast, wore nothing but an old Timex watch. So I love how we're seeing the duality here, the contrasting ideas. Edwin Murray was at an age where he knew who he was and he knew who he wasn't. Never, not even when he was young as Mr. Burroughs, a good-looking fellow. Edwin had accepted that his imagination was his greatest strength. He wasn't overly concerned with his appearance, although he liked using it to have a little fun. At five, uh, five tall, um, Edwin was slight. No matter what he ate, uh, he remained skinny. When he'd been young, his round nose, slightly slanted blue eyes, and two large ears had given Edwin a gnomish appearance. As he'd aged, he decided to get playful with that fact. He'd let his thick head of white hair grow long, and he'd groomed a short pointed beard to go with a full moustache he'd worn since he was old enough to grow it. The beard covered Edwin's insubstantial jawline and weak chin. In retrospect, he probably should have grown it a long time ago. I see no reason why the creative process can't be automated, Mr. Burton said. What? Oh, come on now, Mr. Burton said, leveling a condescending glance at Edwin. You can't tell me that story creation can't be computerized. Record labels use software to write songs. I don't see why we can't create stories in a similar way. We could replace most, if not all, of the creative team with one computer. He snapped his fingers, and just like that, we're out of the box. The overhead overage is gone. Computers can't write stories, Edwin said. Why not, Mr. Burroughs said. Most of the Fazbear Entertainment stories, the ones that are the most popular, share similar elements. I think it quite likely that these elements and a series of pre-programmed options could be used in concert to come up with new, randomly generated stories. Think of it like a smorgasbord. 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 I don't know what that is. <laughs> the average buffet probably has, what, 40 or 50 dishes, meats, casseroles, salads, and so on. And most of those are made from the same 10 to 15 or so foods. You can create a virtually endless variety of meals from those few ingredients. We'd use the same principle to create a computer program that would combine various tropes and characters to come up with an endless variety of stories. Mr. Burroughs snapped his fingers again. We could call the program the Storyteller, he beamed at the rest of the board members. What do you think? Genius, one of the women said. A couple of the men chimed in with inspired and love it. <laughs> uh, Edwin couldn't take it. He pounded a fist on the table. I can't believe you're talking about firing the creative team. A computer can't, Mr. Burroughs ignored Edwin. He leaned forward, his beady little eyes all lit up like an eagle with an injured bird in its sights. We could even turn the storyteller into part of the pizza plex's appeal. It could be a huge draw. It would become the star of every show. The pizza plex's ringmaster, if you will. Mr. Burroughs laughed and threw out his arms as if he was introducing the cast of a three-ring circus. Edwin could almost hear tinny circus music in his head. 
Where are the clowns? He asked himself. That's a ludicrous idea, Edwin protested. Your idea is a slap in the face to all the hard-working people who have created all these storylines you're planning to stuff into some insane computer program. Hard-working doesn't mean good, Mr. Burroughs said. If their stories were good enough, the Pizzaplex would be generating enough revenue to cover all those expensive creative team salaries. What do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, God. They do realise these stories that they're talking about are, are real, right? Right? They're not just rumours? <laughs> Clearly there's room for improvement, and I think we should hand the task of that improvement over to the tech team. They can create the storyteller. Edwin stood up so fast that his chair spun out behind him and hit the wall. Your plan is an insult to me and to every writer on the creative team. Mr. Burroughs leaned forward and steepled his fingers over the spreadsheet that had preci pre precipitated his scheme. He scanned the faces of the other board members. Edwin's offensive side who's in favour of creating the storyteller and letting it take the place of the current creative teams. Edwin glared at the other board members as every man and woman in the room raised a hand. Unbelievable! Edwin shouted. You're all idiots! Mr. Burroughs pressed his lips together and stared down his nose at Edwin. Careful, Edwin. You're close to getting yourself thrown out of this meeting, if not the company. Edwin could barely hear Mr. Burroughs' words through the roar of his blood rushing in his head. He smoothed his beard and straightened his shoulders. Don't get too big for your britches, Mr. Burrows, he said. I can't be fired, as you should know if you've bothered to read my buyout contract. And I may not have a lot of power here, but I can't, you can do nothing, Mr. Burrows said, flicking his fingers toward Edwin as if Edwin was a pesky mosquito. But I tell you what, because I'm feeling magnanimous, we will make you a consultant on the project. You can have some input on what story elements are programmed into the storyteller. Edwin's chest constricted. Every uh, His doctor had told him he shouldn't let himself get riled up. It was bad for his heart. Well, Edwin was definitely riled up. His face was hot and his fingers tingled from the rage that was coursing through his body. If you're finished with the theatrics, Mr. Burroughs said, perhaps you could retake your seat. Peg, could you please help Edwin? Peg got up from her seat to Edwin's right. She gave him a gentle pat on the shoulder as she stepped past him and retrieved his chair from where it had come to rest, next to a table that held a silver coffee urn and a crystal plate full of fancy pastries that were always present at the meetings and that no one ever ate. Peg pulled Edwin's chair over to the table. She took his arm and escorted him to his seat like he was geriatric. Edwin had his issues, he knew. He'd been haunted for years by things that he should have done differently. But he didn't need help. He wanted to lash out at Peg, but he wasn't. Uh, he was too much of a gentleman to do that. Peg was actually a pretty nice lady. Maybe she wasn't the smartest person in the room, but she was the kindest. So Edwin didn't protest when she helped him back into his chair. Indeed, he uh, instead, sorry, he smiled up at her as if he wasn't envisioning himself setting the building on fire. Wink, wink. There, Mr. Burroughs said, once Peg had retaken her own seat. Now let's continue. I propose that we put together a tech team to create and program the storyteller. It shouldn't take too many techs. We, sh we won't want to hire anyone new. We can just pull people off other projects. Edwin, his heart still galloping in his chest, spent the next couple of minutes concentrating on his respiration. His cardiologist had taught him a breathing exercise to slow his heart rate and lower his blood pressure. The doctor frequently hooked Edwin up to a biofeedback machine to help Edwin track the effectiveness of his internal focus. He was getting pretty good at regulating his vitals. He used that skill now to calm himself. Mr. Burroughs' idea, like too many other Fazbear Entertainment ideas, was extraordinarily, was extraordinarily short-sighted. I'm sorry I keep messing up, by the way. Right off the top of his head, Edwin could think of a dozen ways the storyteller could go wrong. If he had any hope of preventing a tragedy, he had to keep it together. No one would listen to him if he was ranting. Edwin raised his hand like a demure schoolboy. Peg smiled at him. Mr. Burroughs cracked his knuckles and said, Yes, Edwin? Edwin put everything he had into keeping his voice measured and not allowing even a trace of disdain to taint his words. You keep talking about the program choosing elements from a small smir- <laughs> God's sake. Smorgasbord or- Smorgasbord? Smorgasbord of characters and plots and themes and so on. But how exactly would the storyteller devise the stories? 
You can't just randomly pull story elements together and expect to create a story. You can end up with all character sketches and no actual story arc, or all plot with no interesting characters. How will the storyteller determine how to combine the elements you program into it? No one answered Edwin's question. Instead, one of the other board members, Waylon, a boarding man with very large teeth, asked, What should the storyteller look like? Peg chimed in. That's a good question. If the storyteller will itself be a character seen by the Pizza Plex's patrons, it will have to be something other than just a garden variety computer interface. Mr. Burroughs waved his hand as if shooing away a fly. We'll think of something, he chuckled. Maybe we should let the storyteller itself decide what it's going to look like. A rumble of laughter swept the room like an ocean wave rushing in and receding. Edwin didn't join in. Once again blocking out the discussion around him, Edwin looked past the self-important board members. His gaze scanned the ridiculously modernist art on the room's vast walls. He could remember when the boardroom had been decorated with framed Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria signboards. Edwin had enjoyed the vintage posters. Mr. Burroughs, however, had ordered the old posters removed as soon as he had become the board chairman. He was going to have them put in the trash, but Edwin had rescued them and taken them home. Uh, it seems Edwin has a past with Freddy's. I, I, like, I feel like that's, I feel like that's something to keep in mind right there. The fact that he kept those posters. Maybe, maybe it reminded him, because he is old. He is the oldest chairman, right? So he probably went to Freddy's when he was a kid. Wow. Didn't think about that. Um, he wasn't sure why he'd wanted them. He hadn't hung them on the walls of his pathetic one-bedroom walk-up. In all honesty, Fazbear posters reminded Edwin of a past he'd rather have forgotten. There we go. He'd rather have forgotten the past of Freddy's. What happened at Freddy's? If he'd been forced to explain himself, he'd probably have to admit that keeping the signboards was a form of self-punishment. He, he had much to atone for and no way to do it. Maybe keeping the images of Freddy Fazbear close was Edwin's way of keeping himself on the hook for all the mistakes he'd made. Mistakes that had snowballed into a disaster the day he'd agreed to sell his company to the behemoth that was Fazbear Entertainment. The truth was that even though Edwin tried to make himself useful at the company and tried to live a semi-normal life, he was rarely actually in the present moment. He lived primarily in the past, back in the days before he'd made a hash of everything. Edwin's cardiologist had recommended that Edwin see a therapist, and the therapist had told Edwin that he had to learn to be more mindful. You must stop reliving or reliving what is no longer real, the therapist had said. Practice mindfulness. Concentrate on the details of the reality around you. Be present. That was easier said than done, so he didn't even bother to try. Yes, he moved through the real world, but he didn't see much of it. What was in front of him was usually obscured by visions of his old life replays of his worst mistakes, images of what he'd once had and lost. Mr. Burroughs clapped his hands and snapped Edwin out of his reverie. Edwin blinked and looked over at the board's bombastic leader. It's decided then, Mr. Burroughs said. We'll get the design team working on the storyteller ASAP. Even though his heart rate was under control and his expression was placid, deafening warning bells were going off in Edwin's head. He was having a strong sense of deja vu. And that wasn't a good thing. Not a good thing at all. The storyteller went from concept to construction at almost the speed of light, or so it seemed to Edwin. Although he'd tried to stall the project, the idea took hold too quickly for him to implement any of his plans. Everyone was thrilled with the storyteller. Every techie on the team fairly buzzed with glee as they worked on constructing and programming the Pizzaplex soon-to-be star attraction. Edwin was given a consulting role on the project, but he was never actually allowed to consult. He was aggressively kept on the periphery of the engineering process, so much so that he was never even allowed to see the storyteller specs. That made him nervous, very nervous. On the rare occasions that Edwin did offer an opinion on the storyteller, that opinion was ignored. He had suggested, for example, that the storyteller be confined to a remote part of the Pizzaplex in order to give it an enig enigmatic aura, perfect for the fans who enjoyed the mysteries of the Pizzaplex. His true reason for the suggestion was his conviction that the storyteller would, at some point, become a problem. But it didn't matter what his motivation was. The storyteller was built right smack in the centre of the Pizzaplex's atrium. Construction of a central hub began days after the board approved the creation of the storyteller. 
Like everything else, the design of the hub was Mr. Burroughs' idea. I think the storyteller should reside in a huge fake tree, like a wise old owl in the old growth forest. Kind of like a tree of life, Mr. Burroughs had said. Since story is the lifeblood of Fazbear Entertainment, it makes sense that the storyteller will be the lifeblood of the Pizzaplex. When the design team had met to decide on a style for the storyteller's tree, there was much debate about what kind of tree to use as a blueprint. At first, Edwin just listened to the ideas. How about an oak tree? Yvette suggested. Edwin had always liked her. With an impish face decorated by piercings and a couple of intricate flower tattoos, Yvette was bright and focused, but she was always quick to laugh, and she treated Edwin with, with respect. This was something the other team members didn't do. We had an oak tree in our backyard when I was a kid, Yvette said. I always imagined elves or fairies or something lived inside its gargantuan trunk. I think a tree like that would be perfect for the storyteller. Not an oak. The burly engineer next to Yvette barked. An elm. Elms are stately trees. Yvette smiled placidly at him. That was another thing Edwin liked about her. She was peaceful. Twice he'd caught her meditating in one of the back hallways of the pizzaplex. Her ability to look serene amid all the noise and commotion that radiated throughout the building, no matter where you are, was amazing. The other team members began talking at once. Edwin heard redwood, eucalyptus, olive, fig and poplar. Everyone had some reason for their tree choice. No one liked anyone else's idea. The discussion was beginning to degenerate into a shouting match when Edwin cleared his throat and said loudly, Baobab. <laughs> Baobab. That's B-A-O-B-A-B. -B -B. You can look it up. It is a real tree. I think it's like African or something. Um, or Asian, I can't remember. Um, the rest of the team stopped talking and stared at Edwin. He didn't give them the chance to start up again. He continued quickly. The Baobab tree is one of the longest living trees in the world, and it's one of the hardiest. Baobabs thrive in the harshest of conditions in the droughts of Africa and Asia. Who'd have thought? <laughs> um, wow. They're bizarre looking. Their trunks can be over 30 feet in diameter. The width of the Baobab tramp trunk will suit our purposes perfectly, allowing plenty of the room for the hardware needed to sustain the storyteller. As always happened, whenever Edwin had even thought of the storyteller's name, nausea welled up within him. He determinedly, uh, he determinedly ignored it and went on. There's a baobab tree in South Africa that's over 6,000 years old. Its trunk is hollow and is a tourist attraction. There are all sorts of legends associated with the baobab tree. Given that the tree we use is housing a storyteller, choosing a tree associated with grand narratives seems appropriate. I've never heard of a... a bow... a bow what? The freckled tech said. Baobab. <laughs> it's the Bab tree! Edwin pronounced slowly and patiently. Yvette, who had been fussing with her phone while Edwin spoke, handed the device to a freckled guy. I think a baobab is a great idea, Yvette said, while the freckled guy frowned over the picture of a baobab on her phone. She took back her phone and held it up so everyone could see the picture. See? They look sort of like an oak tree that's been uprooted and put back in the ground upside down. They're weird and cool. And isn't that what Fazbear Entertainment is all about? Several of the team members nodded their heads. The freckled guy said, Okay, I'm down with it. He pulled out his laptop and tapped a few keys. Then he turned his laptop and showed a screen filled with images of several baobab trees to the rest of the team. What do we want to go with? Tall and thick or shorter and rounder? The question sparked another 15 minutes of debate. At the end of it, the team agreed to design a tree with a trunk that had a vaguely bulbous appearance. It would be 15 feet in diameter at the bottom, swelling to about 25 feet across at about 10 feet or so up the trunk and then narrowing again to just a few feet wide as the trunk climbed another 50 feet up to its branches. The trunk would extend nearly up to the Pizzaplex's domed roof, wink wink, and its branches would spool like a 50 foot wide skeletal umbrella over the Pizzaplex's center. Still not at all pleased with the project, Edwin felt an unexpected sense of satisfaction for having contributed to it in such a visible way. Now he just hoped that the whole thing wasn't going to be the disaster he was afraid it would be. 
Construction blasted into overdrive. With little else to do, Edwin took to loitering around the construction zone watching the tree take shape. This morning, he had parked himself on a bench near the Pizzaplex's main concourse. Um, in spite of the myriad or myriad negative associations Fazbear Entertainment held for Edwin, he couldn't help but get caught up in the glitz and glam of the Pizzaplex when he was in the midst of its action. Who could resist the splendour of the place? Fazbear Entertainment was known for the wild and wonderful and over the top, but the Pizzaplex soared above and beyond anything the company had come up with before. From the bright yellow roller coaster track that twisted through luminous, multicolored serpent like climbing tubes to the pinging, bleeping games arcade and the buzzing laser tag arena, the Pizzaplex was a masterpiece of happy ha sights and sounds. And also, the Pizzaplex was the game's Pizzaplex because it's very clearly that at this point. At its busiest, the Pizzaplex was packed with spun up kids and jovial families, and all the happy screams and shouts and chatter was like an electrical circuit that, if it could have been harnessed, probably would have generated enough power to run a dozen Pizzaplexes. Edwin watched a little girl wearing a bright pink frothy dress skip past. The girl's patent leather Mary Jane shoes tapped a sprightly rhythm on the tile floor. Edwin smiled, but then a familiar old pain forced him to look away from the child. Oh. He turned to watch diners churn through pizzas in the flashy main dining room packed with shiny red topped tables and chrome chairs. Scanning the boisterous crowd, he idly wondered how it might be possible to channel human joy into a machine. It had to be possible, he mused. Oh my gosh. Let me read that again if you didn't catch it. He idly wondered how it might be possible to channel human joy into a machine. That's very related to agony, I would say. Like, agony obviously is the strongest, or at least um, uh, Phineas Taggart uh, concocted. Oh, concocted? Conducted? No, concocted. Concocted. I don't know. Um, but like, agony. Agony themes are there. Human emotion, powering machines, uh, animating the, the dead or the lifeless animating the inanimate um so that's interesting i feel like edwin kind of like had a job at fazbear entertainment and there was an incident or something and it was his animatronic or something that's my guess right now i don't know i have no idea edwin returned his attention to the baobab tree that would house the storyteller would anyone realize the tree was a baobab Although the tree's fat trunk and sparse branches were reminiscent of the tree they'd chosen as the basis of the storyteller's tree, this bright and shiny tree didn't look like any real baobab. Loath to have the centerpiece of the pizzaplex be a dull tan in colour, Mr. Burroughs had decreed that the trunk of the storyteller's tree was to be the same vibrant yellow as the pizzaplex's roller coaster. Edwin's protest, uh, Edwin's protest that tree trunks weren't yellow was completely ignored. <laughs> At least the artistic team had taken some initiative to diminish the freakish impact of the yellow. They'd had the tree's trunk painted in several tones of yellow, ranging from the roller coaster's lemon to more subdued shades of flaxen, mustard, and light goldenrod. These variations in tint had been applied to textured metal, and this gave the trunk the stri striations of a real baobab bark. The combination of a mottled application of different yellows and the bumpy metal at least approximated Mother Nature's version of a tree trunk. The tree branches' hues were similarly fanciful. Green is such an uninspiring colour, Mr. Burroughs had said. When the green, green is not a creative colour, uh, Mr. Burroughs had said when the design team had first brought its vision to the board. The team had no choice but to toe the line when Mr. Burroughs suggested that the tree's branches be the colours of the rainbow. <laughs> so the tree that Edwin watched grow up in the middle of the Pizzaplex was like no tree that actually existed on Earth. Sprouting from a pear-shaped yellow trunk, a kaleidoscopic array of sparkling multicoloured branches exploded like a contained spray of fireworks, frozen in time above the Pizzaplex's core. What an incredible sentence right there. That's so well written. LED lights made up the tree's root system, which splayed out from the trunk's base and stretched like gnarly groping fingers out to the edges of the concourse. From there, the roots appeared to sink into the floor, disappearing under the black and white tiles of the concourse. 
In actuality, the roots were a network of wiring that connected to every venue in the Pizzaplex. That wiring would sync up with the story-driven attractions and feed its programming to the appropriate hardware. It's like a fungus at this point. It's like mycelium. Uh, every animatronic in the Pizzaplex would get its instructions from the storyteller via the tree's roots. The roots, Yvette had told Edwin, were receiving those instructions from the storyteller through a network of fibre optic cables within the tree's trunk. Edwin really wanted to see those fibre optic cables, but he wasn't allowed inside the tree trunk. And this was something he took great issue with. Why can't I see inside the tree? Edwin, <laughs> Edwin asked Mr Burrows, Burrows after the, one of the board meetings. The board members had gotten up from the table and they were trailing out of the room. Mr Burrows was placing his papers carefully within a crisp red folder. Edwin had waited for Gretchen to pass him, holding his breath so her heavy perfume wouldn't poison him. Then he'd hurried up to Mr Burrows. No one is allowed inside the tree, Edwin, Mr Burrows replied to Edwin's question. This development in the project had come about after a board discussion of how to protect the storyteller's intricate systems. Although originally conceived of as a character that patrons would see close up, the plans had changed to keep the storyteller hidden from view. The storyteller's tree will be enough of a draw, Mr Burrows decided. We'll keep the storyteller behind the scenes. That will add the mystique of it. Or to the mystique of it. The storyteller will be the Pizzaplex's Oz. That pronouncement had raised goosebumps on Edwin's arms. Oz had been nothing more than a man behind a screen. Would the storyteller be just as ineffective? Well, clearly someone isn't allowed inside the tree, Edwin protested when Mr Burrows denied him access. The tree's interior isn't being created by magic elves. Mr Burrows rubbed the big nose he seemed inordinately proud of. He offered a fake laugh. How droll, Edwin. Yes, of course. The construction crew is allowed inside, but no one else. Even I haven't been inside the trunk. It's all hush-hush. But you're the chairman of the board, Edwin said. Why would I want to spoil the surprise? Mr Burrows asked. Do you unwrap your gifts before Christmas, Edwin? If you do, shame, shame. <laughs> Mr Burrows clicked his tongue and turned away from Edwin. Short of snatching at Mr Burrows' expensive blue suit coat sleeve, Edwin could do nothing else. He watched Mr Burrows strut from the room and decided he'd figure out a way inside the tree eventually. When Edwin wasn't lurking near the construction zone, he was surreptitious. <laughs> oh God, these so there's so many big words in this book. He was surreptitiously. He was surreptit. He was surreptitiously, surreptitiously, or oh, repetitiously, surreptitiously. I don't know. Gathering every working memo related to the storyteller project that he could get his hands on. Thankfully, internal security in the executive offices wasn't stellar. The Storyteller project had been compartmentalised away from all the other Fazbear Entertainment projects, but the occasional memo found its way into the light. Edwin turned himself into a memo scavenger. He gathered them up the way a squirrel gathered nuts. Unfortunately, the memos didn't help Edwin much. Everything related to the storyteller was cryptic in the extreme. He did manage to glean one tidbit, though. He'd learned that the larger parts of the storyteller were to be transferred into the tree trunk late one night after the Pizzaplex's closing. Given that Edwin had access to every part of the Pizzaplex, he was sure he could position himself at the appropriate time and place to get a glimpse of what was being placed at the hub of the Pizzaplex. And he was right. At 11.42pm on a drizzly Thursday evening, Edwin slipped into the Pizzaplex via the loading dock. The drab, concrete walled area was deserted, as he knew it would be, and he had no trouble weaving his way through the back halls until he could come out into the corridor outside one of the restrooms near the jungle-like expanse of Monty's Gator Golf. As he'd hoped it would, one of the fake plants in the lobby of the mini-golf venue provided cover for a perfect vantage point from which to observe the entrance of the storyteller's tree. From the shouts and thuds coming down the hall on the opposite side of the atrium, Edwin could tell he'd arrived just in time. Something was being brought in. Edwin brushed aside a wide, thick plastic leaf and gazed hard at the entrance of the tree. The tree's door, which wasn't so much a door as it was a hidden curved panel that blended right into the rest of the yellow trunk, was open. Unfortunately, a shadow consumed the resulting gap. Edwin could see nothing inside the trunk. He could, however, 
see what was being carried toward the open door, and what he saw bent him over double. For several seconds, he could literally couldn't breathe. Gasping audibly, Edwin clutched at his chest. A sharp pain shot through his ribcage and his lungs constricted. Did you hear that? A man's voice asked. Edwin shrank back into the shadows of the Forks jungle. He dropped into a crouch, closed his eyes, and covered his ears with his hands. <clears throat> it wasn't that Edwin was attempting to pull a child's stunt, blocking out the world in a misguided attempt to be invisible. If the workers found him, they found him. He wasn't trying to hide. The reason he was trying to shut down his senses was because they were transporting him back into a horror from his past. The sounds, a screech and a scream, his own yelling, the sights, blood, so much blood, and a gut-clenching grimace. The smells. Edwin gagged at the metallic scent that suddenly assaulted his nostrils. He wanted to moan. He needed to run. But Edwin did neither. Even in his flashback, Edwin was aware that if he was found here, any chance, of, any chance he had of minimising the storyteller's potential damage would be lost. So, Edwin uh, forced his body to ride out the memories, trembling from head to toe, sweating so profusely that it felt like a waterfall had erupted from his neck and was pouring down his spine and enduring vise-like pressure in his head. Edwin kept himself contained. He made sure that everything he was feeling was managed silently. After his initial gasp, he didn't make a sound. Vaguely, as if he was listening to them via a distant TV, Edwin could hear the scuffs and taps of multiple footfalls, and he heard voices. At first, the voices were indistinct, their utterances a mishmash of sound that Edwin couldn't pass into specific words. After a few shallow and quiet breaths, though, Edwin was able to discern three different voices. Are you sure the sound came from over here? One voice asked. The speaker was male, young, and exasperated. I thought it did. This was the first voice Edwin had heard. It was the man who had heard Edwin gasp. I think you're just hearing things, a third voice said. This voice belonged to an older man. His tone was low and rough. Come on, the younger man said. Let's get this thing in there so we can wrap up and take off. The older man chuckled. The sound was a rumble that, for some reason, Edwin found soothing. The low register of purring slowed his heartbeat. The sharp pain sc scoring, through his head, uh, scoring through his chest abated. You letting this place get to you? The older man asked. A scrape and the rustling of clothing preceded a skin-on-skin -skin slap. The sounds of a scuff lay. Edwin thought. I don't know what a scuff lay is. Um, cut it out, the first man said. Act your age. The man's voice was close. Too close. Edwin held his breath, willing the men to back away from Monty's gator golf and return to their task. Edwin's will apparently had some clout. <laughs> clout. The men did exactly as Edwin wanted them to. They retreated toward the tree. Edwin commanded himself to get it together and ever so slowly eased toward his original vantage point. He concentrated on breathing softly and evenly as he prepared himself to take a second look at what had nearly unhinged him. It took just a couple of seconds for Edwin to reposition himself behind the outermost leaves of the plastic plant, hoping that the three men wouldn't look his way again. He raised his head until he could see the tree. And there it was. The thing of Edwin's nightmares. Guys, you are never in a million years going to guess what this is, okay? Never. You're never going to guess, okay? I'm going to give you a few seconds. You can write a comment. Say, like, okay, I'm at this time and I'm going to write this comment. I'm going to be like... This is my guess on who the storyteller is because we're just about to find out who the storyteller is and I'll tell you, it is insane. <laughs> okay, I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. Edwin gritted his teeth and held his breath again. He ignored the tremors that vibrated through his body. The three men had returned to their task, which was to carry into the hollow tree trunk a giant white tiger head. Not a real tiger head, obviously. If the thing the men were hefting was a real tiger head, Edwin wouldn't be as rattled as he was. Ha, <laughs> he thought. Rattled was an understatement. He'd had a full-blown, nearly untethered-from-reality meltdown. No disembodied tiger head would have caused that, unless it was like this tiger head. Keep a grip on it, one of the men warned. It was the old guy with the rough voice. He was exactly as Edwin pictured him. 
He had a heavily lined face smudged with a couple days of beard growth, and his greying hair was thinning. But he was big and beefy. He was clearly in charge of moving the tiger head. Edwin could well imagine that the head was tough to hang onto. Even from this distance, Edwin could tell that the three foot wide tiger head was made of metal. The white painted head rose up nearly four feet from a set of tiger shoulders, and the underside of those shoulders was slick, slickly smooth and gleaming silver. Edwin could see the edges of a surface that glowed like polished platinum. For all Edwin knew, the tiger head could have been made of platinum, although the one that lived in his memories hadn't been. Grunting and grousing, the three men managed to wrangle the tiger head through the tree's open doorway. They disappeared into the shadows that obscured the tree trunk's interior, and once they did, Edwin exhaled loudly. He immediately turned and headed back the way he'd come. There was nothing else for him to observe tonight. He'd seen enough. Oh my god. The storyteller is fricking the tiger rock animatronic? Excuse me? Um... So here's like, here's like the theory at the moment, right? So Tiger Rock is, hmm, should I say this now? I'll say this now. Tiger Rock is a story about, uh, is, a, is an upcoming story if you don't know. It's Tales from the Pizza Flex number seven, I believe. Uh, yeah, number seven. And in that one, uh, we have a story about the tiger in Tiger Rock. Um, and it's about someone who is playing a VR game. Uh, essentially, um, and that VR game uh, is is going to make the Tiger Rock animatronic come to life, or something like that. And we we don't know what's going to happen, but that could be related. And um, I may as well say this now as well because I might forget later. But uh, there is also something else that's pretty big, and that is that in the next book, number six, Nexi, the third story is called. Uh, the Mimic. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's weird. It's weird that it's called The Mimic. Um, oh wait, no, I didn't even give the context of that. I, I just, I, my brain completely froze when I said that. Okay, the third story in the next seat is called The Mimic, which is an amazing title. And guess what? I reckon Edwin is going to be in that story. Okay. I reckon Edwin is going to be in that story. We've seen it on the word count that he is going to be in Nexi somehow. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Mr. Burroughs faced an array of flat screens lined up precisely on his Queen Anne credenza. Sighing, he tapped a few keys on the keyboard and leaned forward in his crocodile leather chair. He studied the nearest monitor. Yes, it was just as he'd been told. There was that annoying Cromagion skulking behind one of the large leafed plastic plans at the front edge of Monty's gator golf. He was a persistent little rat, wasn't he? Edwin Murray had already been a thorn in Mr. Burrow's side with a buyout contract that gave him an exorbitantly large salary that he in no way earned, but ever since the Storyteller project had begun, he'd become a human gnat, con constantly buzzing about, questioning every aspect of the new project. Mr. Burrow steepled his fingers as he watched uh, Murray flounder around behind a fake bush. What was he doing? Mr. Burroughs leaned even closer and studied the screen. He frowned. The old man's eyes were nearly bugging out of his head. And was that sweat? <coughs> Apologies. Um, shaking his head, Mr. Burroughs tapped a key to stop the security video replay. He made a mental note to praise the security team for bringing Murray's actions to his attention. He didn't think, however, that Murray was a problem. Yet. The man couldn't do any harm watching from a distance, and there was no way he could get inside that tree that housed the storyteller. Mr. Burroughs had made sure that the tree's door was accessible only by himself and a select few of the construction team members. No, Murray wasn't an immediate issue, but he might become one at some point. Mr. Burroughs would have to stay on top of the situation. I love how we're getting two different perspectives in the story. Friday morning, just a few hours after he'd recovered from his panic, Edwin marched down the long, wide hallway on the top floor of the Fazbear Entertainment Executive Office building. Once again cursing the building's annoyingly plush carpet, Edwin charged past portraits of executives and famous characters. In a comic display of contrast, the staid and proper portraits of the executives were alternated with cartoonish depictions of the characters. Edwin had always wondered whether the hallway decor was meant to poke fun at the executives or an attempt to elevate the importance of the creations. 
Edwin never made it to Mr. Burroughs' office. Instead, he ploughed into Mr. Burroughs outside the executive washroom. Men of Mr. Burroughs' stature didn't use mere restrooms. Well there, Edwin, Mr. Burroughs said as Edwin bounced off the taller man's midsection. Where are you off to in such a hurry? Edwin, panting at the effort to stay upright on the cushy carpet, caught his breath and wiped his moist forehead. I was coming to speak to you, he said in gulps of air. What a joy for me, Mr. Burroughs said. His sarcasm was evident. Mr. Burroughs flicked an invisible speck off the lapel of his charcoal grey suit. He straightened the deep purple pocket handkerchief that matched his tie. Purple. <laughs> what programme are you using to create the storyteller's stories? Edwin asked Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Burroughs sighed. Why can't you just trust the storyteller, Edwin? Edwin shook his head. Just tell me what programme you're going to run. Mr. Burroughs shrugged. It's a simple template style software that takes pieces of previously created stories and rearranges them into new scenarios for VR, AR and arcade games. It's as slick as it can be. Beta testing is going beautifully. It's going to be sweet. Edwin seriously doubted that. Who's doing the programming? He asked. Mr. Burroughs waved away the question. We have our best minds on it. No need to concern yourself with it, Edwin. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm late for an appointment. Mr. Burroughs didn't wait for Edwin to reply. He stepped around Edwin and strode down the hall. Edwin frowned at Mr. Burroughs' retreating figure. There absolutely was a need for concern. Edwin had to get a look at the storyteller's programming. No matter how hard he tried, Edwin couldn't get his hands on any of the storyteller's programming specs. And then, to his profound chagrin and deep dread, the storyteller was brought online. The big reveal of the storyteller wasn't a reveal at all. Edwin thought the storyteller's birth party was a crock. Every patron in the pizzaplex had seen the tree go up, and the storyteller itself was kept hidden. As a result, Edwin thought the hoopla surrounding the storyteller's activation was little more than a high-tech tree lighting. With great fanfare, the LED lights of the tree's branches and root system were lit, and the crowd dutifully oohed and aahed at the colourful display. But that... And a big shaped and a big tree shaped cake was the extent of the storyteller's first day of the job. How do you make a tree shaped cake? <laughs> I would like to see a tree shaped cake. That's gonna be very top heavy. <laughs> um, Edwin supposed the whole thing should have been a relief. The storyteller programming was running, and nothing bad was happening. Maybe all of his worries had just been um, his memories getting the best of him. Then again. Edwin had decided that since no one else expected a problem with the storyteller, it was up to him to monitor the impact of the program. To that end, he began hanging around the various Pizzaplex venues, observing the way its characters behaved and analysing the new stories being portrayed on the various stages throughout the entertainment centre. And he saw issues right away. The first problem he saw was in Roxanne Wolf, the queen of her domain, Roxy Raceway. Roxanne Wolf was an animatronic with a punk rock look. With bright yellow eyes, purple lipstick and a green fingernail polish, Roxanne was a spectacle of sass and style. Although she was just an ordinary grey wolf with black markings, she wore red hot pants with a red crop top, and she sported black earrings, a spiked belt, and purple tiger-striped arm and leg warmers. Roxanne was self-centred and competitive. She loved to admire herself in the mirror and frequently asked others how she looked. Edwin had never really liked her personality, but it was what Fazbear executives had wanted for the character, and it was what Edwin expected of Roxanne when he observed her interaction with the kids in the raceway. What he didn't expect, however, was the mean-for-the-sake-of-being-mean quality that he began to see in Roxanne when he hung around the raceway. Sure, Roxy had always enjoyed poking at people's insecurities because of her own deep-seated self-esteem issues, but when the storyteller came online, Roxanne turned into a full-blown bully. She began verbally attacking anyone and anything around her. It was like her inherent lack of empathy was morphing into a more aggressive form of pathological cruelty. <coughs> Sorry, that was a lot to say at once. <coughs> uh. I need to take a break in a minute, I think. Um, then there was Chica. The bib wearing bright yellow chicken was... Wait, 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 wait. This was something that everybody uh, was like, what about this story? It's the fact that they just said the bib wearing bright yellow chicken. Um, yeah, Chica isn't yellow, <laughs> or at least Glamrock Chica isn't. Maybe, maybe they 
Oh, I have a theory, but I can't say it. <laughs> um, I have a theory because I can't say it because it might have something to do with Bobby Dots Part 2. But yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say it. But if, I think you probably know what I mean if 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 I just said that. So, yeah. Um, it's not like a spoiler or anything. It's just I don't really... Yeah. Anyway, the bill wearing bright yellow chicken was well known for her gluttonous nature. Chica's storylines nearly always included food. The chick loved pizza... Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, never mind. I was just thinking, like... <laughs> Rose always talks about food. And so maybe the glam rocks are powered by bobby dots. <laughs> wouldn't that wouldn't that be crazy? <coughs> the chick loved pizza and was very pushy about getting it, but it uh, she was on the whole one of the more loving characters in the Fazbear Entertainment Rock family. After the storyteller came online, though, that changed. Chica began showing aggressive tendencies. Her loving persona was replaced with a snarky one. No longer interested in her food. Chica became obsessed with getting attention. She was constantly demanding that Mr. Cupcake show her more deference. <laughs> Mr. Cupcake, for his part, began acting up as well. He developed the personality of a vicious terrier. Ah, oh, that's... Wait, that's interesting, actually. Because uh, Chica, in Security Breach, doesn't have a cupcake. I don't think, anyway. But in her... In her green room, there's, there's a Mr. Cupcake. So... My thought is that maybe there was a yellow Glamrock Chica at some point. That Glamrock Chica was thrown away uh, for some reason. Maybe we'll see a story about that in, in the future or something. Uh, and then they got a new Glamrock Chica and that one was white and it didn't have a cupcake. So maybe uh, that is just, that's just a theory. Uh, game theory. Um... Montgomery Gator also exhibited disturbing changes. The alligator featured in Monty's Gator Golf was the quintessential rock star. With a red mohawk, star-shaped sunglasses, and purple shoulder pauldrons, Monty was a performing gator. He was all about being a rock and roller. Rock and roll! <laughs> oh, oh, that's funny. Prone to smashing things as part of his extravagant, extravagant image, Monty was always dramatic. But he had been harmless, at least until the storyteller started messing with him. Now the alligator was turning into a sulky shadow of his former self. Monty's rampages became more violent, and in between tantrums, he withdrew into a depressive silence that was actually driving children to tears. Jesus. All the Pizzaplex's other main characters began to undergo similar personality shifts. Whatever trait was normal for them began to skew toward the dark side. The shift wasn't dramatic. None of the animatronics had turned homicidal or anything. But the altered dynamic was noticeable, at least to Edwin. When Edwin brought the personality changes to Mr. Burroughs' attention, Mr. Burroughs was dismissive. They're just being a little larger than life is all, he claimed. The storyteller is amping up the conflict. Every story needs a good conflict. The program is working exactly as it should be. Edwin wasn't so sure. Not long after he had confronted Mr. Burroughs about the changes in character narratives, the Pizzaplex was beset with strange malfunctions. Although none of the incidents were inherently dangerous, they were concerning. It wasn't the glitches themselves that were the problem, it was the frequency of them. The glitches were relatively benign. Sparking crossed wires, shorted out electrical systems, pipe leaks, random animatronic shutdowns, Sound system static, audio mix-ups in which characters inexplicably changed uh, voices with one another, locked doors that should have been unlocked, unlocked doors that should have been locked. None of these things as isolated incidents threatened the Pizzaplex in any substantial way. No patron was in, sort, uh, was in any sort of peril because of these issues. I just had a crazy theory, but I'm not going to say it. For the sheer volume of problems, Edwin thought, was a big blaring klaxon that bellowed danger. Something was happening, and it was naive to think that the storyteller had nothing to do with it. The timing negated any argument for coincidence, or at least that's what Edwin thought. No one else agreed with him. Clearly, Edwin was the only one who could do something about what was going on. He had to get inside the storyteller's tree. So if you haven't put it together yet, I am pretty sure, like, tell me if I'm wrong, pretty sure this is a story about how Glitchstrap got into the Pizzaplex. That's crazy, right? That is, that is crazy. Like, I'm smiling just at the thought of that. That we have this story, that's, it's, it's insane. We're only like halfway through, I think. 
But, um, or not even that, I don't, I, I don't know how long we're through. But, we're, we're, we're pretty far through, and this story is great, in my opinion. It's, it's showing a lot, uh, and I like that, and it, it gives a lot of future opportunities as well. Wink, wink, Tiger Rock. 